Excellencies, distinguished guests, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be part of this important seminar in commemoration of the United Nations International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. And let me particularly welcome representatives of civil society here, because as I continue to speak around the world on various issues, and in particular the failure of the United Nations and the Security Council to deliver on its mandate of ensuring international peace and security and development, more and more the consensus is growing that there should be greater collective action on the part of civil society. So I will return to that later, but this is why I'm particularly happy that we are so well represented here. I've been asked to speak on colonialism, discrimination, and apartheid, and I thought I cannot address that subject without referring to both countries, South Africa and Palestine. Because colonialism, discrimination, and apartheid violently distorted the course of history and the natural development of people on the continent of Africa as well as in the Middle East. The colonial regime applied the rule of force and at no time tried to hide this. And as we just listened to Professor Peer tell us about the steady land grabs, you could see that the law of force is still very much in place and has acquired some kind of legitimacy. Africa and most of the Arab territories lost their rights to their land and to their natural resources under colonial domination. And one of the most visible manifestations of the legacy of domination is a geography marked by segregation and deep inequities over land. So from the earliest of times, here in Africa, the demands of the colonized were for land and liberty. Um, South Africa's history of oppression, exclusion, dispossession, and selective advancement of the white minority resulted in the systematic discrimination and exclusion of black people in all facets, political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights. Prior to 1994, the date of our democracy, there was no concept of equality before the law. The advent of democracy in 1995 opened the opportunity to build an equitable society and the promise of civil, political, and economic, cultural, and social rights for all in the countries. And now, two decades after the transition to democratic rule, uh, many believe that the geography of apartheid remains largely unchanged for the poorest and most vulnerable South Africans. The promise of our constitution, as set out in the preamble, is to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. And section one, one spells out the founding values of our society, human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights. And the Constitution imposes a positive obligation on the state to take reasonable legislative and other measures within available resources to achieve this. Instead, if you listen to the voices on the street, transformation has not occurred. If you look at the states produced, stat the statistics produced by Stats South Africa, uh, a, a part of the government, uh, Trans transformation has not occurred. 56% of the population is poor. 25% of the population live below the food poverty line. And unemployment levels are 27.7% and 36.4%. Extreme income disparities, mainly on racial lines, are recorded in World Bank figures, the top 10% in this country hold 53.8% of the income. 
and 95% of the wealth in the country is in the hands of 10% of the population. I served on the uh, high-level panel established for Parliament uh, and where we held nine public hearings throughout the country in South Africa and we heard from thousands and thousands of South Africans of their frustrations and dissatisfaction. And right now I'm supposed to be in Parliament uh, as one of the persons delivering this report to the Chief Whips in Parliament, but of course I, I consider being here so important that I, couldn't, I wouldn't change my schedule. So of course we have to acknowledge there have been important progress uh, and in, in some of the key indicators since 1994, especially the partial deracialization of the top of the income pyramid, but the trends have been too weak to change fundamentally the inequalities and injustice that have their roots in colonialism and apartheid, but which have been largely reproduced in the generation since the end of apartheid. So I'm quoting from the high-level uh, panel's report, which in turn looked at research in this regard. Um, the, the panel's report catalogues the anger and frustration expressed by people countrywide over poor governance, corruption, lack of accountability, failures in service delivery, and the astronomical looting of state assets. And this is what we heard from the public at these hearings. Um, the huge disparities between rich and poor is a hand down from colonialism and we still burdened by this, but it can be addressed. The death of five-year-old Michael Konapa who fell into his school's pit toilet and suffocated to death is a shocking example of the poor being left behind in South Africa. And when I was United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, I stated strongly that food, health, water, and sanitation are not commodities for sale to the rich, but are basic human rights to which all are entitled. So although we understand that colonialism and apartheid are the root causes of our situation today, we have to acknowledge that other factors are also contributing, if not aggravating, causes. So there is much that could be done by government leaders to advance transformation. Our leaders must take responsibility for ending obstacles to advancement presented by corruption, criminal conduct, mismanagement, incompetence, and other failures. And these failures must be addressed as systematic problems, not uh, merely as problem of individuals. So aimed at the progressive realization of social, economic, and cultural rights as directed by the Constitution, the government should actively engage in the process of realizing these rights, placing emphasis on the vulnerable groups, black groups, black people in general, women, children, persons with disabilities, as well as the poor of all race groups. So our affirmative action should not be driven by race, but should be driven by delivering, protecting the rights of the poor and the most vulnerable. So let me now uh, speak about Palestine, and I speak from my experience as six years serving as High Commissioner for Human Rights, where Palestine was, the occupation in Palestine was on the agenda. South Africa and Palestine under occupation by Israel, you will recall, were the last two states uh, still subject to colonialism and therefore fell for consideration under agenda item 7 of the old Human Rights Commission. In 1994, when apartheid ended, South Africa came off the radar and the Israeli occupation of Palestine continues to remain on agenda item 7. Now, there is 
so much criticism of this from Israel, from the United States, and from the uh, lobbies uh, supporting Israel. And they use expression that the Human Rights Council bashes Israel, that that's all it does. And that criticism also, fed. I became an Israel basher as well. There is a denial of the word occupation and complete hostil hostility to any comparison to apartheid. Uh, but the importance of re re retaining this Agenda item seven and the occupation is that there is continual monitoring by the Human Rights uh, Council on the situation there and violations. The Israeli occupation began after the Arab-Israel War on 5th June 1967 and on the 50th anniversary the current UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres stated the occupation has imposed a heavy humanitarian and development burden on Palestinian people. Among them are generation after generation of Palestinians who have been compelled to grow up and live in ever more crowded refugee camps, many living in abject poverty with little prospect of a better life for their children. The occupation fueled recurring cycles of violence and retribution, and this I witnessed uh, in respect of the Israeli Defense Forces um, operations in Gaza, for instance, the cycles of violence and retribution. So everyone agrees that there should be a solution and that the aspirations for statehood and sovereignty of Palestine is an urgent matter. And as uh, was recalled by uh, Minister Nabir Shah, in 1947, after the end of the Second World War, the UN General Assembly adopted Resolution 181, which proclaimed the two-state solution and called for the emergence of an independent Arab state and an independent Jewish state. On May 14, 1948, in a very short time, the State of Israel was established. But no independent State of Palestine has been established despite seven decades of sustained activity by Palestine, by its supporting states, and human rights activists throughout the world. So this is what I meant about the rule of force continuing to prevail so that the UN itself has disregarded, and I would say betrayed, very, very many agreements that, and, and resolutions that itself has adopted. Now, in the Human Rights Council, where we monitor the human rights situation, regular reports are issued each year, sometimes as many as 12 reports in a year, documenting uh, a variety of violations, and the current High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid Al Rad, from uh, Jordan, reported on the 19th June this year that between 2009 and 2016, 64 reports on Israeli violations were documented, together with 929 recommendations by the United Nations Secretary General, by the High Commissioner for Human Rights, by Human Rights Council mechanisms, that's the independent experts, and by the treaty bodies. The reports document the failures to implement a vast number of recommendations and the continuing violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. I, sh I want to now list some of these violations, but before I do that, let me say that although I was continually ad attacked by the extremist Israeli lobby for badgering Israel and for being biased, I was invited by the State of Israel to come and visit the country and, of course, free access to Palestine. Um, because they said they appreciated the element of balance that I had introduced in the reports. All the, most of the information on the violations that are documented 
uh, and, and facts found come from inside Israel. So there are very many organizations, activists, and rabbis who do not support these violations. Um, however, I felt it was important to to add the Israeli response to this in our reports. So this is why I went there and they particularly appreciated my visit to the town of Seredot, which is on the Israeli border from Gaza, and which little town takes the full impact of the rockets fired by extremist rebel groups in Gaza. And I saw how the impact of this on civil society, and particularly on children who couldn't play outdoors at all. They had to build shelters for them. But still, the noise of these rockets landing really traumatized the children. The population there, the mayor in particular, handed me a, a, a rose, a metal rose, made from the shells of the rockets that were fired from Gaza, and asked me to carry this to the mayor of the town in Gaza, which I did. But my uh, observation was that neither side appreciated the human rights of the other. So the town of Seredot didn't, and the people of Gaza we're not concerned about the if effect of human rights. So this is why we have to have a balanced approach on human rights of all human beings in this situation. So, uh, so to list briefly then some of the uh, continuing human rights violations suffered under the occupation. The obvious is the unlawful settlements on Palestinian land, despite the UN Security Council resolution declaring the settlements illegal. The Israeli government, now in 2017, has authorized over 5,500 new settlement units, and it passed a law retroactively declaring legal the unauthorized settlements that were erected. The expanding settlements and implications of a coercive environment and increases the risk of forcible transfer for many Palestinian communities. Secondly, the pervasive discrimination deprives Palestinians of their basic rights. Violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law over the past decades include illegal settlements, unlawful seizures, destruction of properties, demolitions of homes, especially in Jerusalem, forced displacement, excessive use of violence, settler violence, extrajudicial killings, arbitrary detentions, and administrative detentions are collective punishment prohibited under international law. Now, this system of administrative detention of Palestinians, very similar to the detentions, uh, house arrest, and bannings that we suffered under apartheid, this is of Palestinians, their families, including children, for long terms, under harsh conditions, without charge or trials, including denial of family visits, um, as being condemned. More than a thousand Palestinian prisoners, you will recall, went on a hunger strike on 17th April this year to demand an end to administrative detention, solitary confinement, and prison conditions. I met with families in Gaza whose family members had just been whisked off and held in these administrative detention centers with no date, hope of a date of release. Punitive measures were taken against these prisoners who were protesting, including denial of access to their lawyers. So as of now, 630 Palestinians are currently held in Israeli prisons outside the Palestinian territories in contravention of Article 76 of the Geneva Convention, without trial and without hope of release. Now, the Israeli blockade of Gaza is now in its 10th year. That deprives people of basic goods and services and has been condemned as constituting 
collective punishment against an entire people. Water restrictions right now, up to four to six hours a day, affects health and sanitation services, and restrictions on freedom of movement are unacceptable. As the occupying power under international humanitarian law, Israel has the responsibility to ensure the well-being of the population, not the exploitation and trampling of their human rights. Between January 1st and 28th August this year, nine Israeli and 46 Palestinians were killed in the occupied territories. The excessive use of force, collective punishment, arbitrary detention, and killings without accountability are matters of serious concerns. Last week, you would have read, an entire village in the Palestinian territories was sealed off by Israel, allegedly because children from the village were throwing stones at Israeli settlers' vehicles. So this is what I mean by excessive and collective punishment. So everybody is looking for solutions, and it is frustrating that so many reports factual reports done by UN officials and presented to the UN General Assembly has had so little response. These are all violations of the UN's own principles, declarations, and resolutions. So real commitment is needed from all concerned to break the cycle of violence and end the occupation. Now, when we look at the decolonization struggle of South Africa, we see that it gained huge m momentum and was, was so impressively supported by the worldwide anti-apartheid movement led by Oliver Tambo. And he was very careful to adopt a principled approach to gain the collective support of such a wor worldwide community. He mobilized on the moral principle of abhorrence against racism, not uh, support for the ANC. So no political factors entered into the picture. Everyone hated racism, and therefore you had such massive support. Be, uh, rounded up on, the, on this principal position against racism. I have met thousands of people all over the world who supported this campaign of ending apartheid. Some may have been as young as six years old in the 1950s, and they told me that when they were children, they stopped eating South African oranges. So I hope that the Palestinian struggle to end colonization gains this kind of momentum, especially in the civilian campaign of uh, BDS, boycott, dis disinvestment, and sanctions, and that the Palestinian struggle to end colonization, which is hampered by geo conflicting geopolitical interests, by internal divisions, and the special protection provided to Israel by the USA and certain Western states, comes to an end through the collective condemnation of the atrocities in Palestine from civil society. Thank you very much. Well, I think the first question, comment from Tariq was about the metal flower and, and uh, roping together of skulls. So I agree with you, Tariq. You cannot compare the violations against Palestinians with the violations suffered by the Israelis. <coughs> you simply cannot con compare as commissions of inquiry after inquiry into Israeli Defense Force operations in Gaza proved. Uh, the extrajudicial killings are, of course, extremely shocking and they still continue. This is what I meant about 64 reports documenting this in the last five years with no results. The point I was making about being given this metal flower to take across is I observed so little sympathy from the community on this side of the border to the sufferings 
of, of the community on the other side. And uh, so there was, my concern is that they were allowing their strong emotions to affect their values. What SAVE does in this country is a leadership from Mandela, where he said, never again. We will not do to the whites what they did to us. And that kind of reconciliation helped us build a nation here. So as High Commissioner, at, uh, at that point, I worried that neither of these communities cared about the children of the other side. Now, on the right to defense, I, I said already the only ground claimed for legitimacy of colonization is the rule of force. And so this motivated those who uh, struggled against and, and defended themselves against colonialism to take up arms, as did Mandela, that in, in view of this onslaught of violence, and the use of force against them that they were entitled to adopt the armed struggle. But of course, Mandela, for instance, did not go around killing and committing massacres of civilians. Why? Because of international humanitarian law, where the principle is protection of civilians. So the attacks have to be proportional. They have to be exercised with caution. And they have to be uh, rational. The, the uh, measure taken has to uh, be seen to serve the uh, military objective involved. Uh, so that's a right of defense, but it comes with responsibilities. Uh, on the BDS campaign, I'm very uh, pleased to hear that there's so much activity uh, and support from South Africans. Uh, civil society activists as well. <clears throat> so the uh, Human Rights Council authorized the High Commissioner for Human Rights to conduct a database and a study of businesses that are cooperating in uh, products made in the settlements. Now this is a huge victory. Remember it would have been hotly opposed in the Human Rights Council. Um, that they secured this authorization from the majority of member states to conduct this. And they will certainly produce and publish the database. You know, I'm ex-I commissioner now, so don't ask me when it's coming out. <laughs> Watch their web page, and you can always call the Palestinian <coughs> desk at OHCHR to find out when the likely date is. Thank you for your question.